Excellent. Good. Thank you very much for being part of it. Playing hard, playing tough. Just playing good is not good enough. We're gonna show you what league's all about. If there's a lesson to be learned, we're handing it out. This game is our game. This town is our town. Turn the heels and to the crowd. Let's go, yeah. Good evening and welcome to The Joust. My name is Nagy. I'm here as always with my co-host Lee McNeil. But Joust, as we have a very special guest for you tonight, this man is a two-time Premiership winner, chalking up 190 games for our beloved team, the Knights. Uh, he's done. He, he said he's sort of handed everything uh, from uh, minor to mechanic uh, and also uh, tried his hand at acting as well, appearing in a 1988 favourite Australian film, uh, Young Einstein. Please welcome to The Joust, Billy Peden. Thank you, boys. It's <laughs> nice to be here. Good to have you, Billy. Thanks for coming on. Now, we've got to ask... What was like? What was Yahoo like? Was he, Yahoo, a, he was a very strange man. I've, really? I've, I've played footy with some strange blokes, but uh, he takes the cake. <laughs> Look at but it. really, we we didn't have a great deal of interaction with him. I was I was a kid, and it was um, it was just something that I think one of my mates, old man, was in the Lions Club or something, and they just advertised that they wanted extras, and we said, yeah, yeah, we'll go, and not expecting <laughs> that we'd be in it. it turned up in the movie. <laughs> That's incredible. So that was around 1988. So obviously that was pre nights. Uh, and, and then, then the Knights came along and your, you know, your fate was sealed. Yeah, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got to start from, we'll start from the, the beginning, obviously, uh, you know, starting with the Knights in the, uh, in the early 90s, was it 1990, was it somewhere in them? Yeah, 94 was 94, my first year. okay. Yeah. Well, um, it, was, it was a funny old scenario for me. I, um, I started late, I, I played, I think, five senior years footy for Cessnock and, and, you know, made the local rep team, but nothing really special and just turned out that um, a, a former player of the Knights came up and coached at Cessnock, Stevie Former, and, and I think uh, Matty Johns had always been asking them to give their ma his mate Billy from Cessnock a go, so <laughs> I think when Joey got on the bandwagon as well, or Joey Former, they um, they finally thought, oh, we'll give this bloke a go from Cessnock. So, <laughs> what uh, is it with the uh, with the uh, the Cessnock contingent and out from the mainland as well? Curry you know, Curry also around that time was producing some players. Yeah, we've got Mark Hughes from Curry Curry, obviously uh, the Johns boys from Cessnock yourself. Was there something in the water out there? It seems to be all at the, at the, at the same time a big push. Uh, it's, it's just a strange one, I think. You know, It's just always been a great nursery. The Newcastle Local League's always been a great nursery for rugby league and I just think um, I think we were passionate about it at the time and you have to be like that. You have to be passionate about what you're doing and you have to like it to be good at it, I think. So I think we just were lucky that uh, the you know the chips fell our way and we got our few opportunities and, and we were lucky enough to make the most of them. Incredible. Like, obviously, a lot of, uh, a lot of Knights fans uh, remember um, you, especially in that 2001 uh, grand final scoring two tries. In 2002, you left the club and went to the London Broncos. Uh, how, how was that as a bit of a bit of a change? Yeah, it was great. I, I actually played with the Knights in 2002, but went in 2003 to, to London and yep. uh, really loved it. The, I really enjoyed the footy over there. And I think it's, it's a funny old situation in that I think some really good players from over here can struggle over there and vice versa, you know. So it was. I think the game suited me and I really enjoyed it as well. So uh, I think I just enjoyed the different culture change as well. You know, you go from, from Newcastle where you... Um, you know, you miss a goal kick to, to lose a game or something and you go to the movies on Wednesday night and old ladies have a go at you, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> tell you how they could have kicked it. Bloody Knights Nanners, mate. Yeah. They're, they're brutal, aren't they? They are, but we love them, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, you do it, in, you play in London and uh, you can you can do something fantastic and there's like maybe two lines in the local paper So because it's just soccer and uh, rugby union over there. So it was a it was a great change and a different change of pace for me. Obviously, growing up in uh, in Cessnock and playing all uh, your, your footy career up to that point in the Hunter, how was it uh, moving over to London and and you know moving the family over there as well? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we took the family and it was uh, it was just a great experience. I, I loved it. I I didn't I didn't think I'd enjoy it as much as what I did. I I was always of the opinion I never wanted to go to Sydney because it was the big smoke and all that. I, I was just happy being a Newcastle lad and just enjoyed it. And, um, but what made me go to England was that um, all through my career I'd seen th all the better players had gone and finished their career in England and I just thought well, the more I watched of it the more I thought geez I'd like to do that you know and and to get that experience is something that you just can't buy I, you know I would have loved to have to have traveled as a younger man but uh, 
A, he didn't have the money and B, I was <laughs> trying to play footy. <laughs> also, yeah, getting paid to travel and play footy. I mean, that's got to be the ultimate dream. Yeah. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, it was great. You know, you know, I speak to a lot of people and they, they sort of shared houses with people and did this and that and the other to, to get overseas and whatnot. And, you know, we were lucky enough to, I was lucky enough to take my family over and have a house and not have to share it with other people. <laughs> well, I was about to say, it sounds like the Super League over there, they do have some pretty uh, social players. As a younger man, do you think you would have uh, done a few things differently if you'd gone to the Broncos early? <laughs> Possibly, yes. <laughs> but we'll, and we'll leave it at that. That'll remain. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, when he came back, uh, you, you had the, the opportunity to come back to the Newcastle Knights uh, in, in a different role. Uh, a bit of a change of hat uh, as a, uh, the strength and conditioning coach. Uh, how was it returning back to the club after, obviously, a very successful tender there? Yeah, it was, oh, it was. It was something I was really proud to do. It was. Uh, I was really tossing up. I'd, I'd injured my knee in the last game for London, and I was really tossing up whether to go back for one more year. And and they didn't come up with the amount of money I wanted at first, and so that made the decision for me. And then, then at the last minute, the eleventh hour, they did. So it was a. An old order you agreed to to come back home. So. Um, I thought there was probably more future in doing that than just playing one more year as a rusty old footballer, you know. So, <laughs> so I took on that challenge and I loved it. It was really good. Um, we had a really tough year. My second or second year back, we was the year we had a heap of injuries, and I think we came last in two thousand five. Yeah, yeah. So that that was a real challenge. Um, you know, a lot of the coaching staff were under a lot of pressure, and that was a, it was a challenging period. You know, watching the team that you you would do anything for really struggling you know so that was that was a tough period but they're, they're the periods that make the good ones good you know like it you can't you can't play and sail all your life and <laughs> exactly and you good, can't you know? fully experience the good without having let's Absolutely. face it the shit times yeah. but that's something the Knights seem to do really well you know is get the old boys back keep involved in the club when you left the Knights was that kind of part of the plan had they spoken to you about coming back or it, did it just happen pretty pretty organically i guess it, it happened organically i really didn't see it as a natural progression it was um i i i'd had enough at the night so i'd say i'd had enough in the nrl and and i'd wanted a different challenge so i went to england and and it got to the point where i thought oh shit what am i going to do now <laughs> so um and i got back home and spoke with mick hagan and and a few of the other coaching staff and and it just sort of worked out that it, that it was going to happen. So uh, I went down that path and I did it for three years and, like I say, really enjoyed it. And then I actually moved back to London and did it over there for another three. Harlequins, so, was it? The, yeah, uh, Harlequins yeah. Rugby League, So, which was the same club as the Broncos. They just they had previously gone broke and changed names. They were bought oh, by no. the Harlequins Rugby Union. So <laughs> we had a rugby union and a rugby league arm. It was, uh, it was interesting and it was good to see what the other side, uh, the dark side, used to do. Because that would have been—it would have been strange, I imagine, going from Australia, where league's king, over to to England, where unless you're up in the north, you know, it's a rugby union strong stronghold. That's stronghold? the word, yeah. yeah stronghold. Yeah. And we were based in Twickenham as well, which is the heartland of rugby union. So we'd gone from being the dominant sport, rugby league, to the the little brothers in London. You know, so it was. Yeah, we'd turn up to train in our Ford Fiestas and whatnot, and <laughs> they'd be turning up in the Range Rovers. <laughs> <laughs> so. Same city boys, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Was it hard to, to go from that uh, player into coaching role, especially like being around as a strength and conditioning coach uh, to, you know, did you get that fire back? You'd be like, oh, I want to get out there myself. Um, at times you did. Uh, during As part of that role, I used to have to run on the field, similar to what Alfie does these days. And it's very hard not to, to verbalise what you'd like to <laughs> when you get out there sometimes. And particularly because I'd only just finished playing, there was a couple of blokes I'd played against and with that, that either I disliked or really liked, you know. <laughs> so it was um, to distinguish the fact that I wasn't a player anymore was something that, that took a little bit of effort sometimes. Now, 97, uh, I've got to ask, because it was such a, like, it, it, for me, it was such a huge part of my life, and, and Liam's as well, um, even though Liam's a bit of the Closet Bears fan back in 97. Well, yes, we're about to touch on that <laughs> well, now. Yeah, is... I've got to ask, you know, we've, you've just beaten the Bears in 97. The, you're in the grand final for the first time. Uh, can you remember what it was like coming back to Newcastle as uh, about to enter that grand final? Yeah, I, but look, to be honest, the absolute details probably escaped me, but, <laughs> but um, just the, just the, thought process that we were actually going to play in a grand final was something that was so far from what I thought I could have achieved when I was in my early teens or late teens you know like I was just knocking around and just not doing my best you know and next thing you know we're, we're playing for the Knights and we're going to go to the grand final so that was um 
that was a pretty confronting thing for me. I was a bit nervous at first, and then, then uh, just coming back home, the support that we got. I think on the Tuesday afternoon, we went down to Sydney for the grand final breakfast on the Wednesday morning, and people were lining the streets for us to leave on the Tuesday, and we were coming back. <laughs> <laughs> so I think w we all got a sense of the enormity of what was happening, and and that it was bigger than just a footy game. You know, it was more about community and and what what the club could give back to the community for what it, the community had given it over the years so I think and Chief spoke very well about that sort of stuff and it was just something that was I've often said that you just wish that your mates could have experienced like all your mates could experience what we got to experience through that period it's just such a a surreal sort of fun nervous anxious time you know and it, and it was great which is incredible because in the 20 years since, you know, you hear plenty about the game and the wrap-up and what happened after the game, but there's not too much covered, I don't think, that well, I've read about the lead-up to it, but it just must have been a whirlwind. It was massive, and I think even to the point where the night before the game, we'd done our video session and we were just having tea and, and Chief just got up and said, right, everyone in my room, and his room wasn't that big, you know. You know Chief's a big star. And, you know, that sort of thing, but, <laughs> and a big human. And a big human. So there, and there was a, quite a few big humans in the room, so it was very, um, very touchy-feely. But, um, it, you know, Chief got up and spoke, and Mark Glanville spoke, and a couple of the other boys said, uh, you know, Tony Butterfield, Matty, Andrew Johns, just spoke from the heart about what it meant to them and what they'd dreamed of growing up. And... Um, yeah, we we walked out of that room at nine thirty at night wanting to play. Then so it was just <laughs> I'd I'd never had that feeling of unity before, and it was just um, it was just amazing. And from pretty much that moment on, we knew we were in it up to our eyeballs, you know, because like, because we knew no one gave us a chance at it either. We hadn't beaten Manly for eleven games in a row or something like that. So yeah. and they were the incubate uh, grand, you know, they were the premiers the, that you were, they were coming up against. I think we come in massive underdogs at the time. Not that yeah. everyone can remember that now with. <laughs> Uh, the fairy tale finish. Um, That's it. We've washed away all the bad stuff. Thank you. <laughs> <God. laughs> yeah, we don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> now, now you're part of the club for uh, arguably the most successful um, period through between that, you know, '97 uh, leading up to 2002, um, where it seems to be the Knights were almost final staples just um, in in a lot of those years. Um, but there was also a lot going on in the club uh, around that time as well. There was uh, obviously the coach Warren Ryan um, that uh, reading uh, Robert Dillon's book recently, uh, Hard Yards. Uh, Great read, actually. Yeah, if you're a Knights fan, pick it up. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's very footy nerdy <laughs> stuff, but that's my bread and butter. Yeah. I love it. It's phenomenal. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's a fantastic read. But the read there might have been a bit of tension around uh, around around Warren uh, and coaching the club, uh, leading into those uh, that final series as well and that qualifying final against the Roosters. Yeah, there was. Um, yeah. I'd, I'm pretty sure Wok wouldn't step away from the fact that he's a controversial figure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as that footage probably showed a couple of years ago. But um, but on, look, Wok's a, I found him a great coach. He's he's probably one of the greatest footy minds that I've spoken to, um, apart from probably the Johns brothers and a few others. But um, he he had a very gruff manner, and it just didn't suit some people. Um, for the, for what ever reason whether it's egos or you know depending on what people needed to hear to get the best out of themselves so um you know uh, there was meetings where um you know revolts and all that were spoken about um and and it, it certainly made it hard going into the semi-final series in 2000 knowing that there was that undercurrent there of um disharmony yeah when i spoke about 97 the 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 harmony and and team spirit you know I think the team had a great team spirit, but uh, there was just that little bit of um, a bit of disjointedness, I suppose, is probably the word you'd use. Yeah. And um, and you know, I th I think that w that 2000 team was probably one of the one of the best teams I ever got to play in. You know, with some of the players that were there, it was uh, it was a great footy team and and a really fun team to play in. So it's just a shame that um, you know a few personalities probably clashed and and it didn't really work out the way we hoped it would have you know we, you know we thought we were a pretty good chance i think we were playing eastern suburbs yeah in the grand final qualifier 16 nil up and you know we thought we were off to the big dance again and we ended up on the big bus going home yeah it must be a different thing to um to come to terms with obviously being there before uh coming at, fighting you know, against the odds uh to to come up um you know being the bears to, to play manly and then being in that position again must have been something you know a bit 
would have been hard to take probably is a massive understatement and it's something that we could all uh, uh, probably not come to grips with. Um, so, you know, and also there was a real, you know, in the last few years there was a real sort of changing of the guard, you could say, uh, in, in um, you know, players like um, Matty Johns and, and that was Butts' last year and Chief retiring in 99. 99, I think it was. yeah. And so uh, how was it uh, now? You've got 2001 coming in to, with a new coach, uh, Mickey Hagen, and, and, uh, and, you know, starting that year afresh. How, how was that? Oh, it was good. You know, you, you speak to anyone that, that's been coached by Hags and they'll give him a rap. He's just, um, he's, got, he's got a great knowledge. He's got a great demeanour. He, he never gets flustered. Um, and I think that's partly why it worked, you know. We, uh, we, we, like you say, you just mentioned the names that we lost. You know, we also lost Dave Fairley, Peter Shirls in 2000. Um, we lost Chief in the back end of 99. You know, you, you lose those that quality of player and then come out and win the comp a couple of, a year or two later. It's a pretty pretty big achievement for a, for a rookie coach, Mer- remembering that that was Hague's first, first grade coaching assignment. He'd pr- he coached reserve grade previously, I think, at Canberra uh, and the, the year before with us. So that's a, that's a pretty special achievement. I think there's only himself and Gus Gould and maybe one or two others that have done it. Yeah, and it's like you mentioned before, you know, once you have the hard times and then you get the good times, it must feel, you know, so much better. So 2001, after going through a few years while close, but, you know, I, I can't remember who it was, but someone in hard yards, I think it was Tony Butterfield, said that the preliminary final loss against the Roosters was just unbearable. It, it was worse than anything he's ever felt, you know. To go through those rougher years after 97, 2001 must have just felt unbelievable it must have you know truly i guess you guys would have saved it quite a bit absolutely yeah it was just one of those things that it, and we had copped a fair bit of criticism through that year you know that people had said oh, our defense wasn't up to it and the forwards weren't strong enough and then you know you name it people came up with it so um when the final whistle went and we'd won the won the comp it was uh you know it was you could see the pride beaming on a few of the boys faces a, a bit of you know, get that up, you know, <laughs> um, Good, that's yeah. what we want to hear, yeah. And, 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 and it was very much like that, you know. It was um, it was a great effort and uh, it's, it's hard to find a negative with all that sort of stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah. Like, but, um, you know, it, well, one negative there was, so we, um, a few of the boys wanted to get a, a picture of the trophy in the nude. So we got, <laughs> um, we got one of the Herald um, photographers, I can't, his name escapes me at this moment, but... Um, we all got here and, and tastefully um, hit all the pieces that you need to hide. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we thought, oh, yeah, that's just for us. And it ended up on the back page or maybe the front page <laughs> of the paper that week. <laughs> and, uh, and here, all, and then it gets better. 10 or 12 years later, I'm working in a coal mine, which probably goes on to what you're going to talk about later <laughs> as well. But yeah. I'm working in a coal mine. And, and I think when Matt Gidley was made CEO of the night the front page of the paper again was the <laughs> old nude photo, nude photo again. I was going, here I am 10 years later and I still can't escape that nude photo. Oh, I've got a few photos like that, mate. Don't <laughs> they, you, they, you never get away from them, Billy. You never do. I think it's, a, it's just the, uh, this time, this day and age, you know, the photos mm. now, especially the photo, you know, citizen journalists, everyone's a photographer <laughs> now with, uh, you know, it's a minefield out there, yeah. especially when you, you, if you're in the public eye. But so 2001, uh, you're coming into that grand final with Parramatta. Again, uh, you know, underdogs, Parramatta had one of the... the Probably, I think to this date the greatest attacking season statistics wise yeah. anyway mm. yeah yeah no, they looked uh, they looked the money there was uh, I think it was Mark Hughes that was saying uh, coming into that um, the the breakfast the grand final breakfast uh, mm. and uh, you could see the the more camaraderie between the the Knights players but the Eels looked a little bit more uh, uptight can you remember anything about that re- breakfast yeah absolutely I re- they lined us up in the corridor I, I can't remember which hotel it was it was some fancy hotel and they lined us up in the corridor as we were having to parade out on the stage and you could see the Earl's boys like literally you could touch them they were that close to us and you could they just dead set looked like I don't know rabbits in the headlights they, <laughs> they looked like they'd been playing the game every day that whole week and they they just looked spent and um we walked away from that breakfast going, I reckon we got these boats. <laughs> That's so, brilliant. Yeah, so now, the big thing I remember out of that, though, and it's probably showing how my mind works, is that the eels wore turtlenecks under jackets and were widely sprayed in the press. Do you well, think that, that came into it? it? Doesn't yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I thought it was a terrible look at the time, but I didn't know any better. <laughs> but um, did that come into it at all, Billy? Was that... Uh, 
I'd like to say it did, but um, <laughs> we, were, we were more working on their body language rather Fair than their dress <laughs> Fair call, yeah. That's probably for the best. That's why I'm not an NRL coach. <laughs> 2001, uh, you know, game kicks off. You're coming in underdogs again. Uh, and, the like, you know, watching that first 40 minutes especially um, and obviously Joey just controlling that game. Poss- possibly, you know, it was a real... Uh, you know, it was a clinic on on a on a halfback, um, uh, controlling that game. Uh, but then yourself, you know, you know, scoring. I think you scored thirty one tries for the NRL in, in your in your tender there. But you know, not a known try score. You managed two in the grand final in the first half. I think it was. Uh, what was going through your mind? Uh, you know, getting that, getting you know, not just one in the grand final, but but the second as well. Yeah, what, was it, what did I say? Uh, it's a, one of the biggest flukes in sporting history. What well, was it? Sometimes the sun does shine on a dog's bum. <laughs> yeah, it was actually dog's ass. I used to say. <laughs> Ah, the so you've even, been misquoted, sorry, yeah, Billy. That's the sun a even do- shines on a dog's <laughs> ass every now and then. So, uh, yeah, look, it was one of those things. I, I had a funny conversation with Mark Sargent leading up to the game. I said uh, we wa- we were doing a walk around the game. He was the footy manager, and there's the Knights head. And I said, "Geez, I'd love to score a try on the Knights head in a grand yeah. final." You know, <laughs> yeah, I had no. Idea absolutely thought that it was impossible for me <laughs> and uh sure enough scored the first try on the night's head in the grand final so it was uh it's just one of those things that happened um there was some great lead up work from the boys and you know just uh things came together and i think that first half we um i think we only made one error and that, well, i think it might have been bedsy dropping the ball with about a minute to go in the first half so the whole first half we virtually made no mistakes uh you know maybe the odd missed tackle here or there but um in terms of the big stuff, we, we never really made any mistakes and everything we worked on had just worked. And I think I think a lot of that came down to the way we conducted the week. Hagues was really relaxed. Um, you know, I, at that stage, I was, I, I was 30. Um, we had a few of the older players had been around, played quite a few games that, that, that weren't easily... Um, yeah, they were unflappable, really, I suppose. You know, you've got Ben Kennedy there, who's, who's supremely confident. You've got Matt Parsons, who, you know, just nothing worries him. And we just got through the week, enjoyed it, really enjoyed the, the lead-up, whereas you could just tell the Paramount boys were probably struggling with the anxiety of being favourites and, and the expectation that was put on them. Now, going into that um, second half, obviously, coming just off the back of that 2000 game where you're 16-0 up in the, in the qualifying final, and now you're in the grand final, and I think it was probably around similar, um, I think 18 points up or something very close to that. Um, what, did you have any uh, think? you know, were you thinking to yourself, this uh, this is all happening again, let's not uh, let's not oversell ourselves, let's uh, really try to push this to the end? Um, no, no, the, the, uh, to be do- in my mind, there was no thought of the year previous. Um, maybe there was in a few others, but not that I'm aware of, um, that Parra did come back fairly strongly. And um, I, I remember Joey went for a couple of field goals and I was just thinking, mate, let's go tries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you uh, just wanted a third, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> Hat trick in the grand final. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, like I say, sunshine's in a dog's ass. <laughs> I, had to t- I had to take advantage of it. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was just, uh, it just, like I say, it just worked. And we were... Like by the time the Earls were really coming back, we we knew we had it in the bag, and and to be totally honest, we went into halftime break knowing we were going to win a grand final. So it was uh, it was a pretty nice feeling compared to the other grand final where it was just back to the wall. We didn't know what what was going on. We were just ripping in and see what was turning out, you know. So <laughs> it was. Uh, I think uh, Maddie and Joey had a bit of an idea on the outcome, but. They always used to say to blokes like me, they'd say, let us worry about the result. You just rip in and go do your best. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I literally used to let them worry about it. I just used to rip in and try and do whatever I could. That's brilliant. <laughs> so it's four years down the track and you've just won your second grand final. Coming back into Newcastle, uh, was it a really similar sort of a feel? Like, you know, the town obviously alive again. Liam and I were much too young to really be uh, ripping in and enjoying it. I was 12 it. years old. I yeah. was at a sleepover. <laughs> yeah. We actually went out on the trampoline at half time because we thought the Knights had it done. So <laughs> came back in with 10 to go and I think we all shit oh, ourselves. Oh, what's happening? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're, how was it there coming, getting the bus back into Newcastle for, for the second uh, second grand final? Now, uh, how was it sort of different for, for yourself now as a bit of a mat- more mature player? Yeah, it was just the 97 was crazy, you know. There, there was people everywhere. We had police escorts in town. I think Maddie and Joey got on the roof of a police car <laughs> um, at Wall's End. Uh, it was uh, people were just running out of the streets, and it was it was very similar in two thousand one. But the main thing I remember about two thousand one is um, 
Yeah, we came in on the bus in Newcastle Road. I think we turned into the stadium, turned right, and then would have turned left in again. Maybe Turton Road. Is it Turton Road? I yeah, think it's Turton. Yep. Yeah. And the whole, the the place was lit up, like the lights were on, like someone was playing, and the crowd was full. And it, we were just going, it's three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and and the, the crowd, we got 20,000 people at Marathon. And um, we did a bit of a victory lap and you know, had a laugh and all that sort of stuff and drunk some beer and carried on and you know the thing that struck me is on on the lap around and we were in, on the back of a truck was um there was kids there in their pajamas you know like th- four and five years old but <laughs> yeah. in yeah. three o'clock in the morning <laughs> watching a couple of drunks go around the field so it was uh it really struck me and you know then you know there was a lot of shenanigans went on after that in terms of even the crowd or we, i know we got back um after mad more well, for Mad Monday, yeah, and, yeah. and one of the goalposts was bent. You know, like, <laughs> so God knows what the crowd got up to after we left. But it was, um, yeah, it was just it was crazy scenes, and it was, uh, it, like I say to everyone, and I've said it just there before. You just wish all your friends could experience what what you get to experience in that in that crazy little period after a grand final, and even leading up to it. You know, the experiences that you get, it's um, it's certainly not your average sort of. Um, life you know <laughs> yeah, yeah no I, i'll say i bet growing up in cessnock uh and you know and just playing footy and loving footy and then all of a sudden you've got twenty thousand fans there at three in the morning uh for the second time you know and that you have this almost like rock star sort of uh, celebrity status um you know really at, at that very point you know having you know children being brought, brought in from you know probably maitland and all the different areas you know just to see um just to see you walk off the bus must have been pretty special yeah it was and I think a, a lot of us are, are quite proud of it you know playing for the club and and for the region you know, it's um you know you talk about players that come from outside and and whether they become part of the fabric or not you know you look at ben kennedy he came and was was part of the fabric straight away you know uh, whereas you look at if you're going to live in the town you're accountable for the rest of your life you're accountable for what you do on on and off the field you know so if you conduct yourself in the right manner people treat you well and if you don't well they don't which is fair enough and um, I think that was a responsibility for us and to, to go through the good times knowing you had that responsibility made it a little bit better and I think um, yeah I, I just think w- we were really proud of where we came from to s- so to see it um, uh, manifest in that manner was uh, was pretty special it's amazing and you got to pass kind of that feeling of you know Novocastrian pride onto one of the the newest local products in Nick Meany um, handing him his jersey and I believe his cap on debut mate how did could you tell how much it would have meant to a young bloke like that to be handed his jersey from a club legend like yourself and you know a local like a well like, I don't know I don't know whether he remembered me but <laughs> 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 no he, he was uh, he, he was pretty stoked I think you know clearly he had a lot on his mind it was the day before the game at the the captain's run but um you know, I did mention to him, I said, look, um, I've only got one piece of advice for you and that's be the player that everyone wants to play with, which is one of the pillars that the club was built on. And um, I said to him, I did say though, it sounds really easy, but it's not because it means you're putting your team first. And at the end of the day, to put other people in front of yourself is not an easy job. Um, so I think that's why in that era, we had a, we had a lot of success on the back of not as much talent as other teams, I think, is because we were prepared to put the other blokes first. And um, I think that I think that's what the club is is slowly getting back to, but uh, it just t- takes time. It was 2000, uh, 2008, I think, is when you finished up as uh, strength and conditioning coach with the Knights uh, and then went over 2009, I think, to the Harlequins? Or was it? Oh, oh, uh, my years. Seven, eight, and nine. Seven, yeah. eight, nine, yeah. So you, when you said goodbye to, to rugby league as, uh, you know, as, as something that you're doing uh, as a profession and then you've since uh, moved on to, uh, to mining and also being a, a, a representative of uh, New South Wales mining as well. Uh, what was that change like, leaving football? Yeah, it was um, it was hard. Uh, it had been my life for so long, you know. So uh, to to go into something completely different, I'll I'll, I'll admit that it was uh, challenging, but it was also I enjoyed the challenge. I enjoyed the thought that I can go out and and make a quid doing something else, you know. So, and I, I like the challenge of mining. Uh, it's it's not for everyone. It's not the safest industry, although it's making leaps and bounds into getting better. But um, it was just, uh, yeah, it was it was something I wanted the, my kids to grow up in this area. So we, 
because of how the experience I got when I grew up. I, you know, I'm glad that I got them to got they were able to to live life in London and and see a bit of the world. And you know, we did a bit of travel while we were over there, so they got to see bits and pieces. Not that I remember a lot because <laughs> they were young, but but I wanted them to grow up here. And and to do that, when I came back to Newcastle. There was a possibility of a job and maybe a part-time job, but it wasn't going to be full-time. So, uh, you know, instead of, like, I, you know, the family had um, stroked my ego long enough and let me <laughs> stay in football for as long as I did. So I thought, well, it's time for me to knuckle down and, and do what I can do. So, you know, I worked at underground coal mines for eight years and now I'm actually over at the the uh, Port Waratah Coal Services at the, the coal ladder. So similar sort of thing, but slightly different. Still being around the club, obviously uh, seeing uh, all the, uh, the trials and tribulations. Is that a word, Liam? Tribulations? Tribulations, tribulations. yes. And it is our word, word of, of the, the week, week Nagy. <laughs> tribulations. tribulations. If I can find the word sound. Uh, there it is. Word of the week, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for playing along, Billy. <laughs> yes. yeah. um, so you have those, it, you know, do you obviously still following the game and being in the town and, and uh, you know, what's it like uh, being, you know, now a spectator and watching, uh, watching the team go uh, through, you know, living through their successes but also through the hard times? Yeah, it's... Uh, it, it's it's hard to watch sometimes I, I, I won't deny that um but also it gets easier in that your livelihood is not on the line every week like it used to be you know and 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 as opposed to playing you don't feel like you're being hit by a bus the next day you know so <laughs> um but you do you're like the fire still burns anyone that says that they they hate it and don't want to do it you know i think they're they're either cheating themselves or telling themselves lies you know like you don't do it for that long and not enjoy it. Um, we used to joke about it that they were paying us to go and do what we do for free, you know. Like, <laughs> and to the point where even I used to say, I used to say to people, I get paid to train and I play for free. That's <laughs> brilliant. So, so um, at at the end of the day, you you do you love the town and you love the team and you love you love the sport. So um, it is hard to watch the hard times, but like I say, that that the good times are coming back and it's going to be more sweet when. When we do win another comp, you know, which is, I don't think that far away. I think oh, so too. God, no. I think we're just going to have a quick, uh, quick halftime break and we'll be right back to talk about all the uh, Origin uh, Eels game and uh, everything Billy Peden. We'll be right back. <laughs> Beauty. <coughs> all right. That was all. As gold. That's the old literal <laughs> give yourself an <laughs> Welcome right back to the second half of the Joust. We're here with Knights legend Billy Peden. Now, Billy, uh, you were at the uh, the Eels uh, game. Uh, the, the, the recent win we got, uh, finding a bit of form again against uh, the Eels in, in front of a, a nice home crowd there. Uh, and you are up on the, the old boys box, uh, you were saying. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was hosting the old boys box. So I had a few of the old fellas up there and uh, we uh, polished off a few uh, stubbies of 4 gold, of course. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, As is tradition yeah. with the old boys. Yes, yes. Um, definitely mid-strength. But actually, <laughs> two is the one of choice. Yeah. <laughs> then it was a very close game. It obviously came down to the wire. Uh, uh, Liam, you are also at the game. I uh, was. I damn near had a heart attack. It was a <laughs> stressful evening. It was. I've never heard a collective sigh of 15,000 people when they went over for that last, you know, no try at the time, but there was just this enormous sigh as soon as he crossed the line and then dead silence, Parramatta players are cheering and hooting and then the ref goes, I've got no try. Yeah. The place erupted. It was brilliant. I've never I've never seen so many people collectively uh, cheer someone else's misfortune. It was awesome. <laughs> I loved it. Loved every second of it. But yeah, it shortened my lifespan. I think uh, getting that really close win uh, against Paramount, obviously, uh, and the first game of uh, Mitchell Pierce being back. And we like to give uh, uh, a hats off to who we think uh, is uh, was the best player uh, of of that round, um, would you would you agree that would have to be probably Piercy coming back? Oh, I think so. I think it, his steady head sort of got us got us home. And I think if he hadn't have been injured, we would have won a few more games just with the just with the knowledge of being in that position for a long time. I, you know, it was great to see him back. He's uh, you know he's been really good since he's been here, and he's, you know I've bumped into him a few times off the field, and he's got a, a great demeanour. He, he carries himself really well. He's very respectful and. I don't think he's been great. They tested him out as well. I think up straight off the kickoff, they had uh, first hit up running straight at him, second hit up straight at him. They really tested that peck. And besides losing a boot, he seemed to come out of it pretty healthy. But yeah, he just showed what that kind of experienced long kicking game can offer that we've lacked a bit over the last few weeks. He just had the ball on a string, putting Parramatta backwards, 
getting him back into there. And it was unbelievable. It was excellent. He really showed his class. Um, and when you were saying that, uh, you know, Ben Kennedy's came into the fold and just fit in right away, uh, it, it really reminded me of, of someone like Mitchell Pierce, who, you know, was just with, with East for so long. And you just see him as, you know, that integral part of that side. And then mid-season sort of changing. And then you think, is he going to fit in? Is this guy from, you know, Bondi going to gonna come to the Knights and try to make uh, the team his own in, in a really negative way? But I think, if anything, he's adopted the culture. Would you agree? Absolutely, yeah. And the, the couple of conversations I've had with him, he's been really keen to hear some input from the old boys and, and how the club how the club was good back in the day and, and whether there could be any sort of parallels that they could use now. So, you know, you know I think he's... I think he's been really good. Um, you know, hopefully, his he's, um, pack stays together for the rest of the year. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Like we said, we'll, we'll happily donate ours. We, <laughs> we don't have much use for any of the muscles in our body, <laughs> yeah. so if he needs it, we'll get rid of it. You can I think we've got a bit of a, a footage up here of um, Mitchell Pierce's return, um, uh, which you know really sort of uh, you know just just shows when the game was on the line. Obviously, it's ten all at this stage, um, and it's just coming up now right when we needed it and just that kind of control and energy I think in the last few games we've we've been missing uh, and I, th I think uh, you know a lot of the other times being 10 nil down from the from the get-go uh, the Knights would have lost that game absolutely uh, and I think two other things to come out of that try that I love first of all the pass from Chris Hing ding 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 the Chris oldest man in the NRL yeah, yeah. beautiful pass really good quick hands <laughs> but the work of Daniel Safidi as that running that decoy line we, uh, he's my hats off for the week it didn't really show in his stats they were decent enough stats pretty good for a front rower but his impact was huge. Every time we had uh, Parramatta camped in their own 20, he was the first out of the line. He was putting defensive pressure on. He was drawing four and five defenders every time. He got the, you know, I think it was uh, the Kenny Dow try. Four defenders on him, got the offload away. His return was amazing. He's got huge things ahead of him. I'm so glad to have him back. Oh. How important is that big man uh, in, the, in the side? Um, Absolutely. It, like playing, obviously, with uh, a lot of big men, uh, whether it be you know, butts or, uh, or chief, um, and just, you know, having that, that sort of leader forward, um, to a side, how much does it change, uh, when they're not there? Oh, you, you just don't have that alpha figure on the field, if that's the case, you know, um, yeah, we used to be devastated if chief would pull out at the last minute, which he had to on occasion with, uh, with the injuries, with the way he treated his body over the years in terms of the, how tough he played the game. So, you know, it, it's, it is hard when you lose a player like that. So, um, you know, and I think um, I think Daniel's got um, uh, a great future in front of him. It's just um, he's got to keep improving. Now that's the thing. You know, it's it's a, as a younger forward, he's got a lot to to sort of grow into. Not physically, I, I mean, just as in the stature of the game. You know, like a, a man of that size. You, uh, hopefully, down the track, you want him to be one of the most feared men in the comp. You know, you want. And that, that's probably not the the most politically correct thing to say, but you want people driving up that M1 shitting their gear because <laughs> yeah. they've got that big lunatic's going to bash us again, you know? So, And, and that's the way it was. Yeah, uh, speaking with a few of the old boys, you, you talk about, you know, even in the early years when Newcastle weren't winning a lot of games, at least the opposing teams knew they were coming up to Marathon yeah. and they were getting the shit kicked out of them. <laughs> yeah, and that, and, and that was the sole intention. And it, it wasn't malicious. There was no, um, you know, it wasn't, by any means going to be done by cheap shots or anything like that but mate, if you could hurt someone yes that's what you're going to do well, I, I didn't want to have 110 kilo blokes run at me all day so if i get hurt in the first time <laughs> and discourage him from doing it again i was going to do it it's a bloody so, good hard rugby league that is yeah it? so um but one thing uh, another thing about that try you mentioned all the good things there you got chris throwing that great silky little ball and 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 um daniel doing the 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 sort of block play but then for Mitchell to run onto a ball like that he he's got intent that he's going to run you know he's not and it, not many halfbacks are brave enough to do that sort of stuff you know and particularly they're they're trying to orchestrate and do other things and he's had the presence of mind to just go you know what I'm just going to hit a hole here and run which you know that a lot of blokes could learn from that and especially coming back from injury, you know, still out there, still kind of testing himself, seeing if he's all right. Yeah, it was said, a bit of a statement. Yeah, yeah. A, bit, a bit of a statement that I'm, I'm here and I'm having a crack, you know. So it was on beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> but also there was a, you know, we like to give a, an award out, um, you know, for something that, uh, that we, we, we thought was particularly good or particularly bad, and these are the Smiling Brownies. Uh, and this more week, often, though, Frowning Brownies. More often, though, Frowning Brownies. <laughs> but the Smiling Brownies this week uh, goes to uh, Cameron King. I think we got a bit of footage of Cameron, uh, who... Uh, he, he managed to do something very interesting, and that's uh, punch himself in the face, <laughs> and uh, 
and uh, you know didn't even see it coming, which is interesting because it's his own arm. Uh, now, Bill, you've got you've got much more experience playing high level rugby league than Nagy and I, as yeah. we have none. We've none um, yeah. Is that a tactic you've ever heard of? You've ever <laughs> seen before? Where did it come from? Yeah, I think it's just a quality accident. <laughs> how, how do you do that? Like, particularly, he was so surprised when it happened. <laughs> he got himself good too. I remember he stayed down for quite a bit. Actually, yeah. after that one, he was rattled. He, might, he might get six weeks. Yeah. <laughs> get sent to the bin. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's an automatic 10 minutes. We'll be launching an investigation to that, Billy. Don't worry, man. That's <laughs> yeah. it it's going to be very interesting. He was actually asking the referee, uh, can you say, you know, who hit me? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, the Knights got away, um, you know, very, very sort of lucky but it was the win that we needed uh it was the win that we needed coming up against the side at the bottom of the comp uh, obviously without mitchell there uh you know we've, we've been struggling and especially we're lo- losing ponga as well uh, who's just been a godsend uh to the to the team um but how do you see the last uh the last sort of third of the season still a lot of footy to play uh with the likes of of, of pierce back oh well, and i think don't overshadow the fact that kaylin will be back in a week or two as well you know yeah. so to have both of those guys back on the park, it gives a fair bit of potency to our back line, you know. So, um, it, it's, it, I think it's, I think we've got a lot of positives to look forward to. I, I just think if we can keep everyone else else healthy, um, then we're a chance to slip in. But, um, you know, just we'll have to see how it goes. It'll take a lot of mental strength, particularly from the younger blokes. That's, that's the hardest thing when you're a young bloke. But to get the back end of the year, the back third. That's where all the me- mental demons start coming in. You, you know, every every little bump feels a little bit worse. You, you're getting tired. You're sore, um, and you know it's the gristly older blokes that so- seem to sort of cope with that a little bit better. But you know, in saying that, I can't see that happening to Kale. And he's um he's been like you say, he's been outstanding. And he's unflappable. You know, <laughs> is it, isn't it funny how how um how heavily Nathan Brown was bagged for signing him for how much money? <laughs> yeah. I can't hear many of those people now. <laughs> That's it. They're pretty quiet. Yeah. The, the the old peanut gallery of uh, of the NRL, especially you know, Knights fans can be guilty of this as well, and and really just you know having so much faith in the club and really want to make every decision uh, the right one. And you know, there was a lot of people had a lot of faith in Kalen, but I think you know, almost paying market money for someone who only uh, had played a handful of first grade games, and now he's looking at going to be the Dally M uh, of, of the year if he continues to to play well, uh, which I'm sure he is. He's just gone from you know that. Uh, un- unrecognisable player to superstardom in in you know a few short months. Can you remember anyone else um, sort of doing that coming onto the scene and really bursting the way he has? Uh, maybe Joey. Yeah. Uh, apart from that, n- not too many really ca- just come to mind. Uh, probably Freddie back in the day as well. He was um, he was 18 year old and playing for Australia, which you know Kalen's 20. So there's been some been some sort of great players come through at an early age. You know. I almost laugh when they're saying, oh, Kalen might be a bit young and all this for origin. And thank thank God they didn't pick him in the first one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, Billy Slater started when he was 20, so... It's funny you mentioned Origin, actually, because, uh, you know, we all watch Origin together at the Mark Hughes Foundation uh, once a night, uh, Night's Old Boys uh, event at, for Origin 2. Uh, now, Origin 3, Liam, you were watching it at the uh, the Commonwealth Hotel, actually. I was at the Commie, yep. Enjoyed a few delicious uh, delicious red wines. So, uh, <laughs> had a few, uh, knocked a few back that night and watched some footy. Great crowd at the Commie. It's a great place to watch uh, watch live sport, as we've discussed. Do you head down to the Commie at all? Uh, I've been to the Commie, commie on occasions. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I try not to be... Um, What's the right word? Too frequent, <laughs> too frequent, or not frequent enough. <laughs> so, so Stephen Crow's a real, uh, real you know mainstay there. I think every time we go there, even if it's on a you know a Monday night for Moorish Mondays, we run into Stephen Crow. He's mm-hmm. a big fan of the of the commie, and it's good to see all, a lot of nights contingent there. But uh, obviously, not the result that we wanted to get. No, uh, there was uh, it. It was definitely a game that was it was on the line the whole game. I don't recall a game being that close and. You know, being decided so late, it was a hell of a hell of a rugby league game. Despite the result, you know, obviously, you know how I get an origin now. Yeah, I left very unhappy, <laughs> but it was a hell of a game. I think the Blues showed that we've got, you know, we're st- we're at the start of kind of a multi series, multi generational type thing. I don't want to jump the gun too early, but you might I think have, yeah. I think I have, but I've <laughs> been known to do that. But um, yeah, I think I wasn't too disappointed with the loss. Yeah, I, I think it's easy to jump on the thought process of dynasty and all that sort of stuff. And I think that I think we're looking towards a good period with New South Wales. But you know, you can see during that game, you can see why conspiracy theories abound. You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but 
what what I just thought great was New South Wales resilience. You know, I'd never seen a team be under the pump that much for that long, and and end up at in front at half time. Like, and then you would have thought, you know, it'll be a blowout. Queensland will win by by twenty odd towards the back end of the game because because of the effort that was expended in the first half, and they just hung in there. So I thought it was great. Um, mind you, at the time I was trying to throw a stubby at my television. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank, thank God, I, thank God, I couldn't hit it. But um, it was just uh, I thought the resilience they showed was amazing uh, under huge adversity. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of Freddie Fittler's biggest fans, but to see him getting interviewed during the first half, I thought I nearly vomited on my lounge. <laughs> I just thought it's. Yeah, there's other stuff that needed doing rather than a Channel 9 interview. And, and if he was telling the truth, the people from Queensland, all they had to do was watch your telly and uh, they know what he's doing. So <laughs> yeah, that's true. It was, it was a weird one. So I don't know he, how I felt about it. If he's telling that. the truth, then the other team can use it. If he's not telling the truth, that's not, what's the point of adding it? So yeah. anyway. It was it, a weird one. It is interesting seeing it during the game, you know, that you get the half time, they're all sort of, you know, what do you think? What's the plan? And, but, you know, to have it during the first half, especially after, you know, the Blues are under so much pressure. Yeah, I would have thought he had other jobs to Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, plenty, plenty of things to think about. Not to mention, you know, putting a microphone in his face and uh, you know having him broadcast live. Uh, it's definitely something for them to think about. Not but I think it's definitely part of what Freddie's doing with having the players, you know, completely open to the media. He's building a New South Wales team that we can love. Like, remember the last few teams? Mm. It's been, mm. I, you know, I really want them to win, but. Mm. Geez, there's some dickheads in there. It's yeah. like, you know, Freddie's <laughs> really creating this air of we're open. We're your, we're, we're the people's team. You know, we're really doing it for the state. We're not doing it for the trophy. We're doing it for the people in New South Wales. And yeah. I kind of get that that fell under that a bit, but mm. still, mid game, you know, one of the tensest games in on the planet in state of origin. It just yeah, it felt a bit weird. Kind of, mm. I feel like it would have might have taken away for a bit for him. Oh, I just that's just my opinion. I didn't yeah. like it, but um, I agree with what you're saying. I, I and I am a big fan of Freddie, and um, the fact that he he has done things differently, uh, I think that's why we won the series. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, like, uh, what's the definition of insanity is to do the same thing and expect a different result. So that's New South Wales byline for yeah. the last decade. Now. Yeah. So um, you know, at the end of the day, he's done a great job. He put the right people in the right positions, and um, you know, look what happened. So he picked on four. He didn't, you know. Yeah, that groundbreaking enough, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was a bit surprised there. It was just good as a night supporter. You know, obviously we've had three very tough years. And to see uh, a bit of life back in the season this season, as well as a, uh, a New South Wales uh, series win, uh, was something pretty incredible. Liam, we're running very short on time, so we're going to open that sack of yours. Opening the sack. <laughs> That's a big sack. It's oh, <laughs> <laughs> not the first to comment on the size <laughs> no. of it. Uh, there's a doctor currently doing a study on it. <laughs> now, Marcus James Harborn, first question from the sack. I'll direct this one to you, uh, Billy. Should Nathan Ross come into the starting lineup, or do we keep him on the bench? Where do you see Rossi fitting in for the rest of the year? Obviously, Sione received a uh, um, an eye injury, and he's going to be out for two weeks. Yeah, I, I think probably as a as a stopgap, you put him back in the centres, maybe. But um, you know. I think Rossi's a good, great player. He probably deserves to be starting, but um, probably for now, if if Sione wasn't out, you'd probably leave him on the bench for now. But um, he'll definitely work his way back in because he's a quality player. Absolutely, I I actually be really glad to see him at centre. I thought when he played centre this year, he quitted mm. himself really well. His defence mm. was great, good hands. I felt really safe mm. with him on the edge there in centre. So yeah, I think. I think he'll be at centre with Sione out for two to three weeks. Yeah, mm. Fractured eye socket. No concussion though, guys. That's a good thing because when he when he went down, I remember turning to my dad and I said, Mate, that's it. That's mm. he'll be done. One yeah. more and he's done. So yeah. so yeah, we think here at the Joust, Maggie, you agree? Ross I to completely center? agree. Ross to center. I think he's done a really good job this season. Excellent. Yeah. Now, Justin Guion touching again on Nick Meaney. With Meaney having a great debut for the club, should we rest Ponga the extra week from his hamstring strain? Make sure he comes back 100%. Well, I've got to ask also, like, what do you think of the debut of Nick Meany? Um, obviously handing over the jersey. Uh, uh, I a, think it was great, yeah. yeah. I thought he, uh, he handled himself with a plum. He, um, he, wasn't, he wasn't flustered or, or didn't get his uh, feathers ruffled at all. He uh, did his job and, and was really good, I thought. So, you know, he's, he should be really proud of his first grade debut. I thought it was really mature of the Knights because obviously Meany's signed with the Bulldogs next year and a lot of clubs 
uh, tend to look the other way when it comes to, um, you know, and it happened to Kalen last year when he'd already signed with the Knights and, and the, had the Cowboys side uh, that could have used Kalen Ponga and they decided to keep him out. Um, but I think in today's game, you know, with, um, you know, contracts being, you, you know, the, the, the kind of one club players like yourself, Billy, and things like is it seems to be uh, a thing of the past. It is more of a business driven sort of a thing and, you know, players will move around. You can't get too attached. But while you have them on the books and they're talented players, you've got to use them. And I, and I think it was really commendable by the Knights to, to choose uh, Nick Meany in a, in a pivotal role at fullback when they had Nathan Ross on the bench, someone who's played there before. So I think it was just really uh, really good to see that we, you know, this is someone we fostered up and we're, and we're seeing him playing first grade. Mm. Uh, it's, I, I'm, I'm really happy to see him. Hopefully, um, if Pong is no good, to be back in that fullback job. I'd gladly see him, Nick Meany, start next week against the Titans. Having done a few hamstring injuries in my time, they're... Even the, the little innocuous ones are only a few weeks to be out for. You still, you know, if you come back a bit early, you just don't feel right. So I, I'd be happy to have Nick Meany play fullback against the Titans because, like you said, he was, he was great. He was safe. He was really solid. I thought he had a hell of a debut. Yeah. The one, yeah. I think the other thing you've got to do, like I, I'd be totally confident in him being there, but I think you just got to trust your medical staff. If they're saying Kalen's right, then I know who I'd have picking, you know, you, you know, Nick wouldn't be going to Canterbury next year. If Caelan wasn't there, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, So, and you're right about trusting the medical staff. I mean, Tony Ayub, he's one of the best in the business. He's been yeah. everywhere. So, if if he says he's right, then he's, he's, then he's bloody right. right. Yeah. Now, last question for the evening. This one's from Daniel Turner. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, this one's a bit of a doozy. Now, why has Nathan Brown uh, con- consistently decided to go with Josh King over Luke Yates? Okay. Daniel is a Josh King supporter, but we don't think he should be ahead of Luke Yates. Don't think he offers quite as much. I think I'm inclined to agree. I think Josh King over the last few weeks, he, while he's been far from terrible, I just think he's been a, a wee bit below first grade standard. And Luke Yates has shown a few times that um, he's got what it takes. You know, he can play a pretty good game of rugby league at prop. So where do we see Josh King? What's You're closer to the side, Billy. What do you think uh, between those two players? Do you think maybe uh, Yates over, over King or do you think King uh, offers oh, more in the front row? I'm a massive Luke Yates fan. I, I, the, I just love the way he plays. He's like just gets in there and rips in and and just leaves nothing in the sheds. But in saying that, I, I like King as well, you know. So, um, you know, blacks have paid more money than me to make those decisions. <laughs> but I, I just love when uh, when Luke Luke Yates is playing. I, I, it, it, for me, I, I love a bloke that's as passionate as that. I still have dreams about that hit he put on Elijah Taylor at the, Tamworth against the, the Tigers. Tigers. Yeah, that he, was he got penalised for tackling too. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, I'm that's working a, on a letter to Todd Greenberg about <laughs> that. I still haven't forgiven it. That's the worst decision in rugby league history. Easily, like if, if that was the case, Mark Lanville in that '97 hitting who would he hit? Craig Field, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he wouldn't ever play the game again. Yeah. He would have been out. That was the biggest hit I've ever seen in my life. Um, yeah, no, I have to, I have to agree. Like, uh, look, I think King's probably been a little bit uh, under there, but we're 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 down in our f- uh, front row stocks. Got to remember moment. though, we got JJ Felice playing in reserve grade, having signed from the Tigers. Apparently, he's been tearing up reserve grade in his two games so far as well. So we got him to come into contention. In the front row stocks as well. So front, front row is an interesting position, I think, um, especially like the starting front row. It's it you know it coming off the bench is, you know, you get a bit of um, you know you're coming into a bit of a padded side. But you know to ca- take those first big hits and uh, those first hard runs, the meters made in that first half. Uh, obviously, you know, very tough meters. And I think a young bloke like Josh King, who's done his sort of uh, tutelage in uh, in uh, uh, the Knights' colours uh, and worked his way through, much like Yates has as well. But I think just as a front row, I think, I don't know, Josh King's a bit better to take the first few bumps. Would you agree? Uh, I, I just think it's a huge responsibility to be a starting front row. Yeah. Uh, I've actually done it myself. <laughs> Look out. <laughs> I wouldn't my, realize it was at the... <laughs> my first first grade game, starting game was in the front row. So oh, oh, good Against Lord. St. George in Adelaide. So uh, it's a huge responsibility. Um, look, to be honest... I'd probably, I like Yates, yep. but at the end of the day. Um, and to have played a couple of reserve grade games is great. And you, you, it's a great headache for Brownie to have is a couple of front rowers performing. So something we probably haven't had that, that much of over the last couple of years. Yeah, this isn't a discussion we've had much <laughs> since no. we started the Joust. There's been yeah. really no selection talk because it was just <laughs> like, well, we'll just pick whoever's there. And yeah, whoever's fit and we've <laughs> yeah. got left, yeah. It's, it's going to be interesting also. We, we've got some players coming back as well. But obviously, you know, whoever's partnering up with Daniel Safidi, I think that really uh, adds to those front row stocks. I think it's going to be really good. Uh, we'll just finish with a score prediction against the Titans, Liam. Last home game of five. Oh, God. Well, the Titans game last 
week. Oh, not last week. Last time we played him was a bit of a shambles, but yeah. they've seemed to have gone backwards while the Knights have kind of stayed static. So I'm tipping the Knights <laughs> by they're always high scoring games, thirty points to twenty two. Okay, yeah, interesting. Billy, you have a. I'm tipping a closer game. I'm saying eighteen eight. Eight and eight. Red and blue. Nice. Uh, and I'll go, I'll go 30 points to 20, which I thought he oh, was. Yeah, yeah. All right. Same. It's uh, his sale of the century <laughs> tactic. <laughs> Thank that you. price is right. We get five cents above, so you win. Oh, right. Yeah. That's, uh, that's right. That's a little bit before You're my really time. really screwing me, Nagy. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining us, Billy. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. Um, we're, you know, it means so much to Liam and I, especially to have uh, a true childhood hero to, to come and uh, have, talk to us about footy. It's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, if you like the Joust, uh, please, uh, you know, jump on uh, the Joust Facebook page. We're on Facebook, YouTube. Uh, you know the rest of them with it. Uh, Twitter, Twitter, Instagram, Twitter, Instagram, all, all the pipes, all the social pipes right. you can find us on. Uh, hopefully, we'll get that win against the Titans. Liam, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. And thank you very much, Billy. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me, boys. Cheers, cheers. Thanks very much. Mate, I honestly can't thank you enough. Yeah, that was, no uh, worries at all. Brilliant. Try, try not to be too.